thank you all for joining us this morning um, for another um, another fun, exciting, informative topic. Um, this is our first webinar of the year. I do want to remind everybody we will we are recording this. We will be sharing this after the event. We'll send an email to the registration link um, that everybody signed up with. We will be posting this on our YouTube channel. Um, as well. And on there, you can also find all of our previous webinars, all of our product reviews, lots of great content on there. Uh, and there will be time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So please use this, the Q&A feature in Zoom to pass on any questions that come up along the way. We have a lot of great questions to get to from the registration as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve Scheinkoff, our CEO. Thanks, Pat. Welcome back, by the way. Good to have you back. Thank you. All right. This is a good one. This is one of my favorites. Appliance trends and ideas you shouldn't buy in 2023. Let's get started with the worst thing that you can buy. This one. This is a KitchenAid or Gen Air five burner new construction downdraft cooktop. Now, I'm showing you the worst first because the ones at the end are only marginally better. But if we're saying an event properly, we need um, good CFM. This has 350 CFM, 350 cubes per minute. That's not enough. If we're saying you need capture, because the way smoke um, is evacuated out of your house is it's captured by a by a deeper hood, and then it's channeled out of your house. Well, there's no capture area to a downdraft. If we're saying that when you vent, you want it going up or straight out, the shortest run possible, Downdrafts do the opposite. They're long runs with transition. Those are elbows. They go straight down. It doesn't go through the through the world there. It goes straight out of your house. That transition reduces static flow. So what makes this bad is like if you ever use all five burners, it's got the additional draw of trying to drag from the left-hand side over whatever you're doing on the next set of burners and from the right. This is something to avoid. The next Next one's an idea, and, and, and just give me a little bit of latitude because it's a little bit different and not what you're used to. And that is buying an appliance online. And a lot of people say, oh, you're going to bash Best Buy, Lowe's, Home Depot. I'm going to say, no, uh, you should buy from them. Um, HomeDepot.com, when you buy an appliance or something from them, goes through the local channel. It's not like it, it goes through their, reg uh, their RDC regional um, distribution center, goes to the local it goes to the local people and delivered locally. What I'm talking about, there's a lot of, in appliances, there seems to be a lot of online only people. And what happens is a lot of them are, are in New York, New Jersey. So let's say you're in California. There's a lot of people in California on this webinar. So what happens, let's say you buy a Samsung or LG washer, not inconceivable, is it'll, 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 uh, it'll comes from Korea to California, goes all the way to New York and comes back. So if we're saying there's a lack of skilled labor in a lot of warehousing, and, and less handling means less damage. What are the chances of that going to you, of, of getting the product, getting it delivered properly in your home, installed properly, and then if there's a problem, you're gonna be able to call that New York, New Jersey company and have them send someone locally. There's no incentive for them to do so. So those are the two, two of the worst things that 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 you can get involved with appliance shopping. And, and this is a... Um, a takeoff, we uh, did appliances you should never buy back in 2021. And um, it's been seen about 2 million times between uh, YouTube and, and the video and, 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 the, and the blog. And what I always say, I'm not here to bash anybody or it's, if I tell you, if, if you learn what not to do, it gives you one step closer to having a functional kitchen you can enjoy. Um, I'm going to answer all your questions in real time here. Uh, I mean, at the end of the webinar and for anybody watching on YouTube, I don't talk very fast. So you could put me on two times and get a really good webinar. And also I put some bonus stuff in there, some new appliances we saw last week um, that changes changes things dramatically in some of the appliances you should never buy. So let's get started. And one of the things I said last time is don't worry about smart. It's not that smart, but it's it's evolving. And what, what changed my mind is this Gaggenau coffee maker. Um, I went through a training and the, and the, and the trainer said, uh, you want Viennese coffee? I'm like, sure, why not? Yeah, it's early in the morning. And she went online and through their Home Connect app was able to make a Viennese coffee. And when you go to Gaggenau, they have eight uh, coffees if you use their dial setting. 
they have 34 if you go online and it's, it's starting to be a lot a lot like that in on on other appliances as well lg has got special cycles you can down online she's got a really cool laundry dispenser where you can dispense any kind of combination you want online now i make bacon or turkey bacon for my kid every morning and i have to open the door to see that it's open the door to see if it's working but the new ovens have cameras in it so I'd be able to look online much clearer. There are all sorts of neat little functions. So smart is getting better. We're not at the point where Alexa make me lasagna yet, but uh, it is getting better. Um, and I think you should hook up and try try some of the new cycles for yourself. Let's get into things you could buy. The first one, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, researching the family hub side and influence online, showing them all the functionality. And I'm saying, who's going to do all that? Um, you know, you have more functionality in your phone. And I like the idea of running your ring through your uh, through your refrigerator and interacting with your family, but you can interact with family through the phone. I like the family hub, um, but, ooh, we're having some problems here, sorry. I, I like the family hub, but um, I don't think you should pay any more for it. The next one we got bashed a little bit for, it's, it's um, bespoke. Bespoke is a new line from Samsung where you can make the refrigerator almost any color with, with panels you install. And then your, your stove and um, uh, your dishwasher is only four colors. But here's the problem is the stove is always central in a plan. And here's why. This is, this is an advertisement bespoke, but it's, a, um, it's an advertisement for why you shouldn't really consider it just yet. Um, because your stove is central. Your, your, the, the core appliances you're going to use the most is your sink, stove, dishwasher in that order. So refrigerators typically on the side. So really where they should have put all the colors is, is on the stove and dishwasher. Now, if you're wondering what I'm talking about, let's just say we're cooking in this, in this, in this design that they're in their advertisement. You burn something, naturally you think fire, you think water, and you've got to take that burning whatever and put it in the sink. So that's why the, the, uh, the stove is centralized. I'm going to show you some really good pictures to really elaborate on that. Now, the new bespoke, on the other hand, it's kind of interesting. It's it's kind of a novelty. You know, I was at I was at a trade show. They actually put my face on the cover of of of, of the refrigerator. And although most people recoiled in horror, it's a good idea. I have a six year old that's kind of cute. Putting her name up there, putting our dog up there, putting a cat up there. Favorite glass of wine, family pictures becomes more of a novelty. Um, LG is is got sixty colors coming. And now, what makes this interesting is. You can control all the stuff from an app on your phone. You don't have to install anything. And when you get sick of the 60th color, this is stainless steel. But still, I think um, color is the focal point will always be on the stove. It's not a bad kitchen design, but it gives you an idea. You know, your eyes pop in the center and that's where you want it. That's where you typically want color to be. You'll see this bird is only later and the things you shouldn't buy. But um, this is a good picture of what color can do in your kitchen. Now let's go talk about colors too, bad color trends specifically. Black stainless. Black is in. Sheen black is in as a finish. But black stainless is something totally different. It's really an oxide coating over, um, over a, a stainless steel. And it's really easy to breach. Now, I did a video where I basically, I, I showed everybody how easy it was to breach. I breached every manufacturer, every manufacturer refrigerator, $23,000 of refrigerators, that went in an outlet because I scratched the front. Very easy to do. Um, I don't think this is a finish that you should invest in. My mom has one um, in her garage, whereas where it should belong, either a garage or a museum, or it doesn't really matter. Brown's another color that 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 that's kind of tough. This is meal is truffle. They just discontinued this picture. But whether you're talking about toast, coffee, cappuccino, the browns never matched to brown cabinets, glass never matches to the cabinets and, and porcelain never matches either. So there's only three companies that have it. There's Tuscan and Samsung, there's Lacanu that's got 50 and Blue Star's got a thousand. So I'm sure there's chocolate in there somewhere, but this is a, this is a finish I, I, I would avoid. Buying relabeled expensive brands, Whirlpool Kitchen Agent, I'm not picking on just Whirlpool here because everybody, uh, uh, the, all the brands do this. We've got the base, the base, and then you've got the premier kind of manufacturer. There could be a five hundred thousand dollars swing on the same product. Now, this goes two ways. Remember, because you know, if you're flipping a house, 
the the kitchen name name means more than the whirlpool, even though it's the same fridge. So if you're flipping, you may want to consider it for the other thing. But if you're buying products for your house, look at the look at the product, not the label, to a certain degree. And and that's the same for micro. You know, there's a lot of products like microwave draws out. They're all made by Sharp. Sharp owns 11 patents on it. So in this case, you want to buy the least expensive, which oddly enough is not Sharp. Or, um, you know, Sharp has the convection. But you want to look at the the source. Who's manufacturing this stuff? And that's where you buy it because that's probably going to be the least expensive. Combo washers and dryers. I get a lot of flack for this too. But it's always from people that say, well, you know, I use this. It's worked great for me for years. I travel a lot. I use it once, once or twice a week. I have yet to come across someone that says, we're a family five. We use it three times a week. And it's it's been running here for 15 years. Won't happen because what happens is the lint stays in the machine. And over time, we'll seize it. Now, this too will change or could change. This is a brand new, this is a really exciting piece. This is a G wash and dryer combo. That slat you see in the top left, that's a filter, heavy double-sided filter to get the lint. This is a 4.8 cubic foot, so it's not small. It's it's large-sized. And um, it has a heat pump dryer, which is good and bad because it's a 110 heat pump, so it doesn't dry as fast. And heat pumps don't dry as fast anyway. It, heat pumps are, for people who don't know, it's basically a compressor and an air exchanger. So cold goes in, compressor heats the air, Heated air goes in the dryer and it gets recycled. It's a lot more energy efficient. Now, whether a combo works with that filter, whether a 110 heat pump works, Mila has it, but they've got the a higher 1600 RPM and a much smaller um, 2.5 cubic foot drum. But it, if this works, this is, could change the way we do laundry. However, what I will say is I wouldn't plan my new laundry room around it just yet. Single evaporator refrigerators, you don't need to buy them because everyone's got dual evaporator. What that means is the refrigerator air doesn't mix with the drier, colder air of the freezer. So the temperature is regulated better and your frozen foods will taste better if you like to store um, smellier things in your fridge like fish or cheese. Dual fuel ranges. You like the speed of gas and the, elect in the, in the more consistent electric um, baking. However, induction is faster, better to simmer, easier to vent, um, easier to clean. It's more child safe because a child can't turn on with metal. So the faster top is induction. And oh, by the way, if you if you like roasting and boiling, gas is a moister heat. Turkey comes out better in the, in the gas than it does in, in electric. And broiling, you get infrared broilers in a lot of these gas stoves now. Infrared is is the same as that serum I and mean, people are paying 10 grand on Lynx grills. So you get much, it really depends on how you cook. Now, a lot of people say, well, Wolf and Mila specifically have better dual fuels because they identify that and put steam in terms of Mila's and their dual fuels. Wolf's got a brand new dual fuel. It's got a different convection system than raw gas. It's self-cleaning, better burners. But as a rule, for a 30-inch dual fuel, really consider how you cook before you buy one. Okay. All the stuff I talked about now, if you buy a family hub, you may have spent more. Um, um, all that stuff is, is okay. It's just more money than you should have. All the bad stuff starts here. These are the things that you're not, that, that are not easily, that, that will really ruin your kitchen or ruin your life in your kitchen, or in this case, ruin your life. Um, appliance extended warranties, statistically, you should buy a warranty on a refrigerator, especially a French door, because they still somehow put ice makers in refrigerators and then there's leak problems. Um, the bigger pro ranges because they're really like three appliances in one where you're putting steam ovens in, you're putting burners in, you're putting grills and griddles, you're going to have a service call on that. So it, it it is best to have an appliance extended warranty on, on a lot of appliances. But if, I, if I'm saying that, why do I say don't buy it? Because most of what you're buying out there there's no service or support behind it. So it's really the, the, the cost of the paper is really worth the warranty. If you're going to buy a warranty, buy a warranty from someone who has a service department, anybody that has a service department, or even a service department, you don't need to buy it from a store. And the other thing is appliances with extended warranties are not better. Like you get appliances that have seven-year full warranties. Um, the problem with that is Service techs abhor fixing things in warranty because they get paid next to nothing to do it. 
So you may have a washer with a it, that needs repair in year six, but you're not going to find a person to be able to fix it because you're not getting compensated for it. So those are two things you got to be careful of. Uh, uh, you will, if you go in and look in reviews, which is something I, I really recommend, it's not the first time I'm going to say that, the, of, of really the, the betrayal people feel not getting their appliance fixed under an extended warranty, it's, it's really palpable. So just look at reviews and just be careful. Pro style ranges, these are all the rage now. So counted it. I think it was eight or maybe 10 of those at, at this at this new show. And what you're buying is a look, not performance. On this 48 inch range, there's two power units and a bunch of burners that are really simmer burners. The oven size is small. The broilers are about half the capacity and they're not infrareds. There's no grills, very little controls. Uh, if you want a nice looking range, looking to once again, flip, depending on who you are, these are the way to go. Um, if you're looking for a range to perform and something that can be fixed later on, some of these are really temperamental, look elsewhere. If you're looking for a range to perform, you really got to be careful what you buy. Banning gas ranges. Uh, I put this in, someone asked a question of how to convert gas to induction. Um, you got to remember induction uses 50 amps, whereas a, a gas stove uh, a gas stove is just 12 amps. So you need to maybe replace the box, but at least the breaker, you need to run a line, you need to run the socket, and you need to find the elusive electrician to do it. It's at a minimum of three to $3,500 to do that. Uh, and when, it, when there's a big movement to really get rid of gas ranges, and a lot of this climate change comes from California where earthquakes and gas lines don't mix, and I get all that. But for you, um, the reason, the problem is you have a lot of chemists and everything saying that you know, it's nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, particular matter formaldehyde coming off gas ranges. You get a certain amount of that with induction electric cooking. And the answer, the easier answer solvable is, is to vent properly, which this vent doesn't do. Um, you don't have capture in this vent. There's not enough CFM. So here's how you vent. And this is really important because one of the things behind this movement is we had a caloric range when I was a kid. I think there were 8,000 B2 burners max. This cafe has got a 21,000 B2 burner on the right. It's got a grill burner that's 19,000 in the middle and a 17 on the other side. We had eights and sixes way back when. And then you have building uh, windows and materials that keep that air in. So that's where the problem is, is output and, and materials that, that make this a lot of, it makes it more of a problem than it's ever been. So here's what you need to do. You need to have to vent. And this is the right vent in the wrong installation. And I'll explain that in a second. I love, I don't do these, I don't do these uh, PowerPoints and I always give people what I'm looking for, for pictures. I always bring back something that looks good, but is wrong. And I, and I like that. Um, but this is a Viking setup with the Viking hood. It's 24 inches deep. Perfect. They're going straight up with it because the house goes on the other side. Great. That's where gravity goes. Um, and uh, it's got at least 600 to 1200 CFM. Now here's the problem. What they've done is they've, instead of hanging it 30 inches like the um, directions say, they've hung it, it looks like around 42 to 48. So some of that smoke will dissipate. And what are they doing with that shelf? Hopefully that's not flammable, but, but all that grease is gonna get caught on that shelf. And all that, a certain amount of that smoke in, in, in particular matter, it's going to stay in that kitchen only because they installed it wrong, right? So think of this installation, drop the hood down to 30, lose the shelf, and you've got a good, you've got a good, uh, good way to vent. Over the range microwaves. I love this product when it came out in 1990, but it hasn't changed while your gas range has. It's only 16 inches deep. Your gas range is 20. The front burners you cook on are the power burners at 22 to 23. That's why you see a lot of microwave drawers and hoods. Um, being ordered now instead of over-the-range microwaves. Slider hoods, these are designed by designers still because they think it looks good. It, it doesn't work well. And you still lose the cabinet. So you may as well put a nice triangular hood instead and make that a focal point rather than trying to get fancy because you don't have enough capture in this. And now downdrafts. This is a perfect picture, right? This is why they downdraft because you see the nice countryside and the, and the sides. It's more about the windows then it is about the fact that you want good quality air for you and your family to breathe in your house. And you can do both, but you can't do it with um, a downdraft. Now, this downdraft is the best. 
um, that you have induction, so you have less to vent, smart, um, but downdraft is still venting straight across with a transition with no capture, so it's not gonna work. Um, what you need to do, here's a good rule of thumb, right? Two good pictures. I like my sister's because she put a TV in the hood, but she's got a, a really nice view looking out. If you put the sink in the middle, a lot of the really great kitchens have sinks in the middle. I use Drake's all the time. I promise to retire it. Um, but you, you have a sink in the stove. So if there's anything that happens, you move right to the sink. Her sink is the most used. She looks out over the bay on the other side, right? On the, on the other side, same deal. But look at the refrigerators in both these pictures. Refrigerators aren't central. They're in the they're they're in in the opposite side panel. If you feel like you need a refrigerator, you don't need a big refrigerator. If you've got a big island, you have like a bar sink or something like that. What you can do is put a, um, a point of use drawers or a beverage center there and 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 put your vegetables there. Take a look on both. So I, I would recommend putting your sink in the middle of your island instead of your cooking. Or if you're going to do cooking, put an overhead vent. For circulating hoods, um, if we're talking about fumes and particular matter, it's best not to uh, vent them through a charcoal filter and have it blown back in your face. See the slats? That's uh, that's for circulating. What you want to do, if you're going to do recirculating, we talk about all the things you can do if you can't vent at the end, if, that, if that's a, a question that people have, is get a triangular hood because the way it comes, it comes up through a, a charcoal filter and then gets expelled on the side. So you're not breathing it directly, right? And, and here's the worst trend that you're seeing more and more of is not venting at all. I don't know where the fire alarms are in these houses, but uh, you're looking at 120,000 BTUs with grills. Like you have a grill outside and see the smoke coming off that. They're putting that inside the hood on the right. It's going to be $60,000 of the major appliances. They're going to be ruined because they didn't put a hood over it. Same thing on the left. They get a nice small kitchen. They put a, uh, they, they put some thought in it. They've got a nice sink there overlooking, no hood. So it's dangerous. There's a lot of BTUs. They're going to go in your house. Your house is going to, at the very, at the very least, it's going to smell like last thing you cooked. Okay. So last thing is makeup here, which is the law in Massachusetts. It's rather easy to do. Basically, um, you want to run through your HVAC uh, with smart dampers, or uh, the regulations stay at least 10 feet away from your, of your stove um, on the opposite side. So that's how you do makeup air. If you do not do makeup air, if you're from one of the states that doesn't do it, air is going to be made up. It doesn't pour vacuum. No one's being put out on a stretcher because they ran because they never ran, because they ran out of oxygen. Remember, a 1200 CFM um, hood is 1,200 cubes of air per minute. That's the equivalent of a small room of air going through your hood every minute. So what's going to happen without makeup air is going to be made up from your attic, garage, furnace, anywhere it can. So you, if you want healthy air, just remember makeup air. In, in this state, it's the law. Last thing, all you guys do a great job um, that I talk to, and you get some really good questions on product specific. What you really need to do, you need to go to the next level. Who can deliver consistently? If we're talking about sub-zeros and trues and all that that we can talk about tomorrow. Um, these are 800 pound refrigerators. You need to know who's delivering consistently. You need to Google that. I'm telling you that there is an, a problem with skilled labor. A lot of the GCs are pushing back on appliance install. You need to look at that. And if you're thinking about um, LG versus Samsung, um, or Sub-Zero versus uh, uh, Thermador, Gagano versus Mila, all of them are great products. All of them are unique. They have like the unique little, little places, but the tipping point for you should be who can fix the appliance better in your, in your part of town. And it's different no matter where you go. They love certain things in Canada that we just don't sell here because there's no service. So just be mindful of that. I'm always a big believer in, in, in doing your research first, but your research should include delivery. Pat will send you a, a delivery checklist that'll help you out. And, uh, that's it for me. But tomorrow we have the Luxury Kitchen Summit. We have some pretty good guys talking about the future of how you're going to use uh, your appliances. I'm really excited about um, some of these guys. Jan is um, he's a CEO of Mila, a sealer, um, the, the CEO of Mila US, originally CEO of Mila Canada. Um, Steve Trulax is the owner of True Ref, uh, Refrigeration. 
huge commercial company that recently went into refrigerators and they've got new products. Eliza Sheffield is behind the Renaissance, behind Blue Star. And we'll have a few more people that I think will give you a um, good perspective on what might be going on the next one to 10 years. And with that, I'll say thank you and we'll start answering some of your questions. Cool. Thank you, Steve. Perfect. Yep. And you can register for that Luxury Brand Summit on our website, um, like Steve mentioned. Um, tomorrow at noon, we'll be kicking that off. Um, we have a lot of great questions from registration to get to. There's a couple of questions coming into the Q&A already. So uh, please continue to pop in any questions into the Zoom Q&A feature um, that have come up. Um, we'll kick it off. Um, we'll kick it off, uh, Steve and Francesco, with induction that's become a popular topic um, recently. We have a couple of questions around induction. This is this is kind of the classic um, time to upgrade our kitchen, and we're debating whether to change out from gas to an induction version. Uh, you guys want to talk through what kind of considerations uh, need to be considered there? You can start, Fran. I'm yeah. So you know, one thing you, you know for sure, if it's a remodel, new construction, you know, those are definitely different considerations than if you're just replacing gas to induction. So Steve had mentioned earlier amperage. Big, you know, if you're switching from gas to induction, a big thing there to make sure you have the proper amperage to support an induction range. And truthfully, the same thing with an electric range. Induction would use a little bit more, but just when you're going from gas to induction in general. Um, you know, usage, it's definitely different. You know, I personally like induction better than gas. I think it's way faster. It performs better than even professional gas ranges, not only on the speed as far as the how fast you're going to get to a boil or sear or things like that, but it's also the control and how instantaneous you can go from a a, a, um, a boil to a simmer and really within a couple seconds on most brands and they work really, really well. What I would tell you to do is definitely go into the store. Certain pots and pans work with induction. They need to be magnetic on the bottom. Most are. So if you stick a magnet on the bottom of your favorite pans, most likely those will be magnetic. That needs to be the case to work with induction. So we always tell people, take your favorite pots and pans too, bring them into the store. Your local store should have some live induction cooktops or ranges that you can physically use, play with the controls, boil water, see how you like it, make sure your pan works. So those are kind of the bigger considerations, I would say. You know, truthfully for new construction remodel, you know, you, you should be, depending on your area, you should be okay to be able to have that amperage <laughs> the right electrical there, but you definitely want to... Uh, Pay attention to that if you're replacing gas to electric or um, gas to induction. Well, um, you know, I, I moved into a 30 year old apartment and I bought an induction burner. One thing I will say is the control is good and the cleaning is simple because when you're talking about induction, it's pan cooks food. It instead it bypasses the glass. So the glass doesn't get hot. So I just wipe it down. And you know, if you've got small kids, it's child safe. And one thing about gas is like gas or electric, there is residual heat. Um, I do like induction, but still it goes back to how do you cook? Um, you know, if you're a roaster, still gas has got some, um, certainly some, you know, some advantages as well. How do you cook? And now is not the time to talk about the fact there's a shortage, worldwide shortage of induction drivers. But I mean, we did our supply chain things last year. So, yeah. They still creep in this year, unfortunately, but <laughs> another um, another common question um, when considering induction, people ask about the venting, um, you know, so the question, um, the question is, do induction cooktops really need hoods at all? Um, yeah, you want to take, take that? Not if you cook. If you cook, you know, boiling fat, uh, all those this isn't a new thing. Um, you know, when you talk about, like I said, all those fumes that we've discussing, it's just that houses become tighter. So all that air stays in your, in, in your kitchen and you don't want to breathe that air. I mean, we all know somebody when we were kids, like the house smelled like the last thing they cooked. Well, it's, it's more than that. Now um, you don't have some of the problems of gas, but induction, you still have some of those toxic fumes. I honestly believe venting is, is, is one of the most important considerations when designing a new kitchen um, and people are doing it wrong. I mean, they, they relish the window and, and, and you can do both, right? You can do both. 
but you really need to vent. I don't care what it is, unless you don't cook, then then you don't really need anything. Yeah. That segues segues into a couple of ventilation mm -hmm. questions. Um, um, we have a couple of questions. What's the best ventilation hood for an electric cooktop? What options are available for venting air over a cooktop? I think we, you know, you want to spend a few minutes just outlining what a good ventilation setup looks like. Good, Fran. Yeah, really. You know, Steve kind of, again, I talked about this a little bit earlier too. The, the key thing is you want to pay attention to your capture area. You know, certainly that is honestly first and foremost. You want to make sure that the hood is deep enough to get to the, to the front burners or even the front section of your induction cooktop. Um, whatever it may be. And you definitely want to make sure that the hood itself has some sort of capture area to be able to really capture the smoke and orders and then vent it outside. So, you know, where he showed like those slide out hoods, part of the issues with those too, it's, you know, they're small, very, really small filters and capture area. Also above it, there's no area within that hood to really capture the smoke and vent it out. So it's hard for it to kind of collect and it all just ends up going right back into the room. So your capture area really is first and foremost. Certainly with induction, you don't need quite as much CFM or power there. And, you know, just because with induction, it may not be required in certain areas, it's always recommended because you're going to do high heat cooking. You're going to have odors coming into the home. Those are definitely ones that you want to be able to kind of capture it properly and vent it outside. So I would definitely say your capture area, the depth of the hood itself, certainly kind of two of the most important factors. And also just you know, how it's being installed and how it's venting. Is it straight out? Is there lots of turns? The best is certainly just straight out because then there's nothing that, the, once you start adding turns and things like that, that makes the, no matter how powerful that hood is, it's gonna make it less effective and less powerful with each turn that you make. Well, the, there's two other things you wanna consider. With induction, um, you can get away with a 400 CFM hood. Mm -hmm. And and that it, it, over 400 triggers makeup air. So you don't have to worry about makeup air um, at 400. I still think makeup air is important. You don't need to worry about it. The other thing you may want to consider is um, how it's filtered. I, I didn't mention it because, you know, I threw a lot of things at you guys. And um, um, But I like the baffle filters better because it lets the air in. Uh, the charcoal seems to stop the air a little bit. So if you burn something up, it may not capture as well. You know, look for, if you're looking... If you're looking for a, a hood, 24 inches deep, baffle filters, short run out, decent CFM, 400 for induction, 600 for gas. If you cook a lot, you need a little more. And um, that's what you need to do. And then uh, there's a question in the chat. Um, opinion on a gas range in an island with a range hood, of course. Uh, that's a popular, you know, that's a popular kitchen setup you see. Um, and, you know. Um, do you want to speak to um, venting in that kind of setup? I always, I always uh, think of Benny Hanna. People entertain like entertaining, and it's, Benny Hanna is very entertaining. Ever been to a Benny Hanna, Fran? Similar, <laughs> not exactly Benny Hanna, but I've been to similar places. <laughs> okay, next time you go to a Benny Hanna, I think there's one in Cambridge. Is take a look at what they put over it. That hood is massive. Yeah. I'm not saying you need a massive hood. I would say that. Um, if you're getting a 36 inch gas cooktop, get a 42 inch uh, island hood. And guess what? Island hoods don't have to be. When I first started, the most popular island hood was called a chuck wagon, which you can imagine how how that went over in New England. But um, but uh, you can get. You know what you can do is you can build a wood hood, right, with the just that enclosure in there, or you can get something really sleek and stainless steel. But to, to uh, and that's what I would do. I would do it at 36, 42 or, you know, 48, you might want to do 60 and you'll be fine. You're still getting a hood, you go straight up, you'll be fine. Except are you going, where are you going from there? You go straight up and then transition. How far are you transitioning? So I'd worry about that, but yeah. hoods are great. Yeah, definitely no downdrafts behind them. Those will not work. No, at all. God, no. Island hoods, like Steve said, you absolutely have to oversize it because you don't have that wall there to help kind of corral and capture that smoke to go up. We let's uh let's transition to some laundry questions here. We um we talked Steve you talked about it in your presentation uh will a new GE profile combo washer dryer 
be an exception to the rule of thumb. Uh, if you've listened to some previous <laughs> content we've posted, you've you've learned that we we don't usually endorse those combo washer dryers. There there is a new product introduction that um, you know, Stephen Fran, you want to speak to that? We're testing it. I thought it was one of the single most impressive things I've seen. Of course, the single most impressive things I've ever seen. Um, when we talk about appliances, we don't talk about revolutionary technology. We talk about induction being new, discovered in the four, 30s or 40s, marketed in like the 80s. I mean, how many people have an 80 year old have a car from 1980? Yet that's new. The radical new stuff in appliances have caused big problems. Like, and this is before your time, both your time, Pat and Fran. 1987G had a new rotary compressor that didn't work. They put it in all their refrigerators, cost them a billion dollars back then. And then the Maytag Neptune, when they didn't put the gasket in, ruined the whole company. That was the first front loader. It was revolutionary at the time. You know, Whirlpool had that Polara range, which was refrigerator. Then it kicked on. So you can take it from defrost to cooked while you're, while you're at home. Never took off, right? Um, I, I'm, I'm encouraged. The only concern I have is 110 heat pump. Heat pump takes more time. 110 takes more time. And whether that filter works. That filter works. That's a game changer. An absolute game changer. That's what everyone buy. You never have to transfer at a certain point in time. What you put it on, what when you go to when you go to sleep, if it takes six hours, you're still asleep. Mm -hmm. And then you maybe start it again during the um, you know, before you go to work. Again, six hours you're at work. Um, but you design what a lot of new adopters do is they design these spaces around these pieces. And when they don't work, then what? Right. So I'm 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 skeptical but optimistic. And um, Fran, that's not, that's not a product that's out just yet. What was the timeline they? they um, so we're going to be on receiving so one pretty soon to be able to test first. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get them. We're hoping to receive them really shortly here over the next couple of weeks or so. Run them through. That's the beautiful thing here. We're gonna we're gonna run that through, test it a bunch, run it a bunch, see how it works, see how the lint compile, see how long it's taken to dry, but we're definitely excited for it. You know, truthfully, I was surprised too when, uh, you know, I heard so many good things about it, but we're, you know, we're excited for it, but we're going to test it out first and make sure that uh, it makes sense to, to sell. Just mm -hmm. so people know, you know, we have to service everything we sell. So all these problems become our problems. And so when I say don't buy a combo, it's not because I've against the technology or the company's marketing it. We put them through. We've uh, we have a tra um, a training facility where we train techs and 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 look at products and we run those things constantly. And we have a, a senior tech there that looks at the inside of these things, and he's panned all of them. He always look, opens up and sees a bunch of lint after a few a few things. We know where it's going, you know. But this will be interesting. And there's another interesting um, laundry product that was introduced uh, in the last year or two. Um, there's a question about the LG wash tower versus stackable washer dryer. You wanna maybe just speak to what's unique about that wash tower and um, how, you'd com you know, how you'd compare those? We just did a video on it. It's gonna be like next week. Um, you could start, I'll finish because this is like top of the mind for me. Yeah, no, I mean, the wash tower is great. And, you know, it really is a stackable washer dryer is exactly what it is. And the kind of unique thing with those and what, what makes it, you know, really so popular and easy to use is that the controls are now in the middle. So as opposed to having, you know, when you're stacking two separate pieces, you have certainly your washer controls are accessible down low, but those dryer controls can be really up high. And, you know, on some of these brands where they have slanted controls, which, makes it even more difficult to get to some of those kind of higher end, higher controls on a dryer. This puts everything right there, right in front of you. So it really has been a, a popular set for really kind of those installation reasons, first and foremost, just much easier overall to use for sure. I love I, their new heat pump is excellent. 220 heat pump. The only thing that's missing in the wash tower is an automatic dispenser. And I love automatic dispensers because um, here's what happens when you don't have one is it is so hard to do. Uh, you put too much detergent in. Everybody does it, including myself. And 
what happens over time is that soap just stays in the machine and it creates odors and mold. And, you know, over time, it gums up the machine like, like lint um, over time. So an automatic dispenser um, uh, prevents all that. But this is heat pump technology, right? You know, the heat pump, as I explained, air exchanger, get rid of the moisture, compressor pumps into the warmer side, and it's consistently recycled. A lot more energy efficient, a lot better in your clothes, 220 volts, so it won't take as, it takes more time, but not as much as say a 110. And this is state of the art without the dispenser. This is the best you can buy. And they put a lot of thought into it. However, if that combo works, they've obsoleted themselves one week, approximately one month after they've introduced something brand new. But I still love that wash tower. I think it's, it's the only appliance my friends have ever talked to me about ever was wow that wash tower is cool i'm like really we always talk about what you guys do you know yeah, a lot of marketing around that one for sure. <laughs> uh let's keep the questions coming into the q a we have um let, let's pivot to a, a kind of design question um the question is how do you design a home kitchen that won't feel dated in a few years so what are some what are some tactics for getting you know longevity and uh out of your kitchen design there well, I, I would say, let me give you like a, a, a little story. My, my friend, uh, this is like 30 years ago, his family moved out of his house, moved to a different part of Needham. I'm from Needham originally. And I remember walking in the bathrooms and um, he had salmon toilets, Villeroy and Bach toilets and sinks, right? I think I may have told the story before. So his father and mother go to, you know, 20 years go by. He goes into it. You walk into that, that bathroom again, you're like, who put those pink toilets in, you know, if you want to, if you want a stylish kitchen, you, and honestly, but this is just, you're asking opinions here. Um, Cause I'm sure there's designers that make everything look good. I think panelizing is good. I think um, um, there's certainly timeless styles. Um, you can do white, although your kitchen's going to look like everything else, but a pop of color is good. I think all colors over time, I think that that I think you're kind of dating yourself a little bit there, but I think you could put one unusual thing in there and, and have it look good. Panelizing is always in. That's how you make it timeless. You want to make it timeless, stick with white, but I mean, do you want everything? Do you want basic? You want a little personality, spice up your back guard, spice up your granite a little bit, go off white and gray a little bit, maybe add another tone in your, um, in your Island and pop a color in. No, just one. Or if you want, get an LG or Samsung and get them all. <laughs> and then a uh, kind of a follow up to that, but is a wall oven a good choice if one's designing for an aging in place kitchen? So what you need to design for the future. You want to speak to that? Yeah, I would say absolutely. I mean, it, because, you know, with the range, you know, you're really bending, especially a professional style range you're really bending down really low. So if you're doing any heavy casseroles or roasts, turkeys, anything like that, you're having to bend down pretty low to pick that up and grab that. The wall ovens really is perfect for that. It puts it right kind of easy access. You grab it, it's natural. So I would absolutely say a wall oven, specifically in that regards, really in a lot of regards, is, it uh, gives you kind of a lot of benefits over a range, but certainly for that, there's no question I would go with the wall oven. You know, it's a good idea too. Um, we see it, you see it in Dorchester, mounting the dishwasher up, right? Nobody does it, yeah. but you can mount your dishwasher so you're not bending. The, the aging in place means not, aging in place could be called not bending. So um, I would mount my dishwasher up if you wanted to. I'd also, here's a product to avoid, and this is anybody's, is these two oven ranges in 30 inch. That bottom oven, I mean- you almost have to like, you almost have to get on the floor to get to the bottom of that. Anybody's double iron from range, GE. And, 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 I, and I like the idea, especially if you use the, the, the top one um, a lot, no matter, GE, Samsung, LG, KitchenAid, pick one. You go to get a double oven range, man. Your knee joints will, will remember, especially something heavy. Well, you can always think about it as just doing squats with lightweight. Mm -hmm. And uh, with wall ovens too, there are some, models fran you can maybe speak to this that the doors will open to the side so you don't even Correct. have to reach over the the length of that door 
Absolutely. There's some brands like Blue Star and Cafe that do French door wall ovens. There's single door kind of side swing ovens like you can find in a Thermador or a Gaganau. So definitely those options to really be able to not even have to lean over any sort of heavy door certainly make that easier. Yeah. Um, we have a couple, we have a, we have a bunch of questions to get through here, guys, in the last 15 minutes here. So I just want to set the set, give you a time update. Um, let's go back to um, refrigeration. Um, someone is asking um, only under counter refrigeration in freezers instead of traditional. So if somebody's that's that is something that there are more options than ever for. What goes into maybe considering that type of kitchen layout? Um, we. Not plugging the ale at all, because you know that's not what that's not, we're not here for that. However, we have that set up in Dorchester. It's good. It's it's good looking. The only problem is, it's pricey, very pricey to do it that way. It's probably the most cost per cubic foot is to just get under counter drawers. That said, you can buy beverage centers, but again, you got to open it up and. It's not as convenient. I still like the master for you know the the main refrigerator and then then a drawer. But you can do that. It's just it's just drawers are expensive, really expensive. And really, you know, considering what you would typically store in there, you know, you can get some drawers that are wider than twenty four. You know, there's some thirty, some thirty six options with like a sub zero, for example. But you know, you, your larger kind of casseroles or pans, things like that, can certainly be tough. For me. Under counter. And then um, Francesco, you just mentioned it, Sub-Zero. When will Sub-Zero be readily available again? What's the current lead time? And then maybe just because we haven't done it in a little while, what's a quick update on lead times overall? Yeah, so for Sub-Zero specifically, you know, refrigeration, I mean, they really are still over a year out. You know, so we're still, uh, they've been delayed, unfortunately, they're still over a year out. I mean, we do have a lot of great options available for built-in refrigeration that we have a lot in stock available, truthfully, with other brands as well. Um, but Sub-Zero, you're really looking at 12 months still. If you were to order today, that's a 12-month lead time on Sub-Zero refrigeration. In general, I would say, you know, lead times, you know, we're trying to stop talking about the supply chain at some point, but um, you know, it's getting better slowly. It's definitely getting better. Certainly I would say on a lot of, um, you know, ranges like freestanding ranges, commodity type pieces, they're definitely getting better for sure. Some of the premium uh, pieces have still kind of slowly been getting better, uh, but you're, you're starting to see some improvement, but there's still, especially in the premium space, some, some delays depending on the brand and the type of product for sure. Uh, you know, Steve mentioned induction earlier. Induction is certainly a category that's struggling right now due to specific components that really every brand uses. So, you know, that's an issue. Some, you know, certainly Sub-Zero built-in refrigeration can still be delayed. Uh, speed ovens and combo units with some brands can still be delayed. So it's getting better for sure. Uh, but there's still some some problem areas, no question. Here's how I buy appliances. We're back to full strength on on the more basic stuff: washers, dryers, yeah. uh, stoves to a certain degree, non induction, um, dishwashers, not Bosch, but everybody else's. Is I would wait to a holiday. I'm not just saying that because it's President's Day week. When you look, wait for a holiday, for some reason. The appliance, the manufacturers just go crazy. I mean, we're looking at washers that were fifteen hundred, that are eleven ninety nine, or even less um, for a set. So for commodity stuff, wait for a holiday if you can. Um, for premium stuff, buy it when you start your project, knowing that you know. And and the brands they need to look out for are Bosch dishwashers, Sub Zero Wolf, and Thermidor, specifically. Uh, those four are going to take a year to get, at least. And then that that segues nicely into um, we have a couple of questions around planning your, your whole kitchen. So like, what are the best strategies for shopping when, you know, all major appliances need to be replaced or you're, buying, you know, you're redesigning a, an entire kitchen? I thought, I thought our webinar on how to start a kitchen I thought that was probably, that's probably our most viewed because I know a lot of people um, ha have problems here. 
is is first of all is is to educate yourself what do you want i mean what do you want your kitchen to look like how do you cook you know we did a we did a webinar on outside kitchens is one of the best piece of advice is, is to come up with a plan and then walk it to see if it works for you i i think it's i think the first thing you need to do is is find a good gc find good people gc cabinet shop appliance store then you need to pick your appliances because the cabinet shop needs those dimensions. You can't just say, well, I might go wall and cooktop or I might go range. Totally different layouts, right? Is to spend a lot of time in those three areas is to find the right GC and the right cabinet person that can give you designs, but you need to buy your appliances shortly thereafter. It's the people part that's going to screw you up the most, not the product part. That comes later. So really get, get the right team behind you. And that's how you start. But it, it doesn't hurt to look at stuff, to acclimate what do you like and read reviews on different things. I will caution you. Um, house is one of my favorite places to see things. And they had kitchens that were best of 2021 at one time. And I think there was, I, I want to say 10 or 12 kitchens. Of those 12, seven of them had serious flaws to them. Like putting your putting your sink, they have a pro range over here and the sinks on the other side. I mean, really, really bad, bad things. Think of the kitchen triangle, sink, stove, dishwasher, work out from there, but make sure you get the right team behind you. And uh, the right ventilation. Kind of, we mentioned ventilation. Get that was, <laughs> that's funny. I was just going to jump in because it's all, it's those pieces that sometimes that aren't the funnest to think about, like the installation, the service afterwards, the ventilation. Those are the ones that are really going to be the biggest problems if you don't think about those early. You had a really good webinar with Jody Schwartz. Jody is like one of the top designers. Mm -hmm. And she said something. Um, she looks for outer walls. Mm -hmm. I always look at focal points. She looks at, um, at, uh, at, at uh, outside walls and ventilation. I thought she was very interesting because designers, you, you look at those, those pictures that I showed, the last ones, it's like, there's a difference between a decorator and a designer. Yeah. Decorator makes a space look good. A designer knows how to uh, how to make it function as well. Yeah, that was great. And it's a good place to start too. We had that appliance advisors. And the nice thing with Jody, I mean, she works so well with the contractors on those jobs. So she really knows the problems that can happen, not just with the design, but the whole uh, part of the project. Yeah. So really does a nice job looking for those early. That's a recent episode of Appliance Advisors on the uh, on our YouTube channel. I can put that in the follow up email as well. Um, just um, one more question here, um, unless anything pops into the chat. Um, how do you feel about two drawer dishwashers as opposed to the one door style? Depends on who you are. Yeah. For me, um, it depends how you load. This is this is the singular appliance that people either love or love to hate. There's no middle ground here. So um, I would like it in certain, well, now that I cook a lot, I wouldn't probably, but it depends on how you load. Nice thing about it is it's it's really, we talk about aging in place. This is a great dishwasher for aging in place because you never bend that far for that top drawer. I think that's, I think that's really important. As far as feature and price, would I like a Fisher Paykel? I like the design. I like the features of other dishwashers at the same price a little bit better. Um, but but it's a very interesting dishwasher. If you panel it, it looks good. Um, it's unique. And, and, and unique's a good way of going sometimes. You know, Fisher Pecos got really edgy stuff that I like. Um, and I include that. So style, yes. You know, ergometrics, yes. Aging in place, yes. Features, no. I agree. And then, you know, even efficiency and things, I mean, these dishwashers use such so little energy and water, these full-size dishwashers. So that really isn't a concern to run, you know, the top half versus a full load of, on a dishwasher too. Um, it really depends on how you load it. You know, there's definitely some flexibility there. If you're, if you're entertaining or having a party, it's nice to be able to do a, maybe a quick load of glasses or plates and things like that. And you still have the bottom one to put dirty dishes in. So, the, you know, it's good for certain applications for sure. Um, but I would say overall, probably, you know, my definitely a preference thing. My preference would be kind of a full size dishwasher. I will tell you, Fisher Bagel's coming out with a, a really nice, their own built uh, single door dishwasher here in the next uh, month or so as well. So we're looking forward to seeing that. 
Yeah, new stuff though. Yeah. New stuff, you know. Ugh. Trust but verify. God. Yeah. Um, one last question came in before we sign off here. Um, looking for tips on a uh, kitchen for a tiny house build. That's really, that's super specific, but what goes into like, what type of products could be considered when, you know, a kitchen has limited space in general? I, I'll tell you, you know, it's funny is um, I saw something that's, 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 uh, that's perfect for tiny kitchens. KitchenAid had it years ago. I know where it may have been before your time, Fran. It was a in-sink dishwasher, right? With the dishwashers actually in the sink. And uh, KitchenAid had it. There was this company called Four Tiles, Chinese. They have a uh, in-sink dishwasher now. I have no idea. When you say trust versus verify, we don't know them. I haven't seen it. I saw a demo of it, but that doesn't give me any kind of idea of reliability. But I will say this. Um, of all the appliances you can cut down, and not really feel bad about it, I would say dishwasher first. An 18 inch dishwasher almost the same capacity as a 24. So if you want a dishwasher, cut it to 18. That's the first thing I would do before. And then not having a dishwasher, putting it on the countertops, I don't think work all that great, but it's an option. And then you know, the last thing you wanna cut is, when you cut a stove from 30 to 24 or even 20, you don't get a really good featured stove. You don't get a lot of options, a lot of kind of mislabeled brands. It's almost like you go into the wild west of appliances. It's almost like I mentioned those Italian style pro ranges. It's like you're going into like the land of unknown. Yeah. Um, so I would leave, if you could leave the range 30, there are some 24 inch options. Blue Star's got a good one. And then refrigerators, there's plenty of, um, of refrigerators. But again, all the stuff that we've talked about, all the appliances you shouldn't buy or whatever, really depends on how you use it. You know, what we use, who are you? Are you one, two, three, or four people? How do you cook? Do you need a dishwasher? And then work from there. But there's some good options in, in, in every product line. I think the dishwasher is what you cut first. Um, and then you go to a refrigerator next. I, I think 30 inch stove if you can make it. If not, 24, 20. And that's how I do it. All right. I think that's a good good place to stop there. So just to um, re remind everyone, we will follow up with the recording of this session. Um, we will also post it to our YouTube channel. Um, and I'll be on the lookout for an email with this recording and a couple uh, other content pieces I can include in there. Tomorrow we have the Luxury Brand Summit. Oh uh, you can register that on our website um, at noon Eastern. And I think that's a good place to stop. So thanks for joining today and uh, see you next time.